Back in the day of dial-up, it was very common to communicate back to your central location using something called Remote Access Service, or RAS. This was sometimes implemented in a piece of hardware. Sometimes it was built into a file server. We were using software to do that. And we were able to set up our phone lines to be able to communicate and dial in to this RAS server. So we could be in a hotel. We could be in a coffee shop that had a wired connection there for our phone. And we would be able to communicate back and send that information back to the remote site. This was a term that was created by Microsoft because this is the name of the service that was running in that server, Remote Access Service. And it was so widely used that these days, the RAS server becomes more of a generic name for that remote access. Another legacy protocol that we commonly see with remote access is point-to-point -point protocol, or PPP. PPP is a layer two protocol. It's one of the reasons we still see this used so much is we can use it on many different layer three protocols. This provides authentication. It can compress data. It can do error detection. We can even bring up multiple PPP links and use them all at the same time in this multi-link environment to increase the amount of bandwidth that we might have available. You may see PPP used in many different environments, over serial connection. It may be used over telephone lines. It's a very versatile type of protocol, and we see it used in a number of very popular technologies today. One common place to see PPP today is over a technology called PPPoE. It stands for PPP over Ethernet. And that's something we commonly see used on Ethernet connections that are associated with DSL lines. These DSL connections are from our telephone providers, and telephone providers know how to use PPP. They can set up a connection with PPP, authenticate you through properly, build that circuit, and now you're communicating over that DSL connection. Very simple for them to implement as well because it's supported in many operating systems already. You don't have to have a router. The devices that are the DSL modems are simply switches. They work at layer two. So they're very simple to be able to implement. And therefore, the cost of the devices is much less than you would spend on something like a layer three router device. And it's so similar to dial-up architectures that your service providers and your telephone providers are so accustomed to using that it makes sense that they would use PPP over Ethernet. One of the things that this also allows is competition. One of the things you may have seen is that you can get a DSL line, but then choose whatever ISP you'd like to use for that DSL connection. And they do that because once you create that PPP connection, that data can then be routed to the appropriate place. So it's very easy for telephone providers to do this. And sometimes it is mandated. It's part of the law that they have to provide you with flexibility on who your ISP will be. So it made sense to implement PPP over Ethernet because it provided that as part of the protocol. If you've ever been in a position where you needed to look at a screen that was somewhere else and you were located in a different building, you were located in a different country, but you wanted to see and share that screen, you might have used something like Remote Desktop Protocol. This is usually called RDP. This allows you to see exactly what's on a screen. You can share that desktop screen over port TCP 3389 and using a particular piece of software called the Remote Desktop Connection. This software is something that's built in to many different Windows versions. So if you're running Windows 7, if you're running Windows XP, if you're running a Windows server of some kind, there is a type of remote desktop protocol already available in those operating systems. So you simply turn it on, and now you can communicate and share the screen on that device. You can either connect to an entire desktop. RDP can also be used to connect to just a particular application on that particular device really narrowing the focus of what you can see and share on that machine. And you can get clients for RDP that work in Windows, they work in Mac, they work on Linux, they work on mobile devices. Almost everything has a remote desktop protocol client available. So you could be on an iOS device and still look at the remote screen of a Windows server. Makes it very flexible and very easy to manage these Windows devices. Being able to provide access to a single device is nice, but what if you wanted to provide many users access to a particular server or a particular service? You would do that through a protocol that was created by Citrix called ICA, and that stands for Independent Computing Architecture. It's proprietary from Citrix, but it's now so broadly used. If you're using Windows Terminal Services, it's using this Citrix technology behind the scenes, and that ICA protocol is what's accomplishing that terminal services session. 
This allows you to see both remote screens or run remote applications all from a seamless integration. In fact, this particular screen at the bottom is a Linux device that has an ICA client running on it, and it's even running a Windows NT operating system inside of it. Imagine running Windows in your Linux. All this Windows NT is running on a remote device, and you're able now to see this communication on your Linux desktop. You can have many clients, however, connecting to a single server and all of them running independent sessions. You don't have this one-to-one -one relationship like you had with remote desktop. You now have the ability to support hundreds and hundreds of simultaneous users into a single ICA server or a single Windows terminal server. This allows you to have great ways to deploy software and manage software on a single device. If you need to upgrade the application, you upgrade it on that single server. That also means your client doesn't need a lot of CPU. It doesn't need a lot of memory. You can run these very high-end pieces of software and you're simply running it out of a very simple client on your desktop. And there's clients for Windows, clients for Macs, clients for Linux, many, many different clients that you can use to do this and have that great flexibility and administration in an enterprise of all of these different applications all running from these very small clients out in the field. As a network administrator, one of the most basic ways to communicate to another device is over a terminal session. And an encrypted connection is exactly what you want. And you'd accomplish that by using something called Secure Shell, or what we commonly call SSH. This is an encrypted connection from your device to another, and it provides you with a command line view of what's happening on that device. So if you need to administer a router or a firewall or some other server, there's probably an SSH server that is running on that device that you would communicate from your SSH client. That allows you to administer that. You don't have to have a lot of bandwidth available because it's all based on text. And it's also an encrypted link, so you can be sure that this remote communication is completely private.